Okay, it's uh, eight thirty-one, so uh, I'm going to begin. Uh, okay. Hello, everyone. Let me give you uh, the date here. Uh, it's the twenty-first of November, uh, two thousand twenty-two. Um, continuing right where we left off. Uh, uh, for those who are interested, I also had a blog post, the first one I've had in many months. Uh, you can check out this forum blog. Deals with. Uh, this uh, enigmatic figure named Rosenberg, um, stuff there about Mordechai Kaplan, about uh, Yeshiva College, Israel Elfenbein. Um, what else do they have there? Uh, a bunch of other uh, things. Uh, so you can check that out. Uh, last uh, class, I couldn't remember the name of the book that I had in mind. Here it is from the Orthodox Forum, Jewish Tradition and the Non-Traditional Jew, there you have the article by Kanner Fogel, and you can read all about how, um, you know, in medieval Ashkenaz, um, you, we see that people weren't uh, stopped wearing uh, tefillin first for the entire day, and then uh, later we see uh, outright neglect, that they weren't worn at all. He talks about mezuzahs. Rabino Tom says less than 10 years have passed, and there's no mezuzahs here. Uh, so... Um, the idea that um, a lack of observance is only a modern thing, we see very clearly it's not. One of our listeners said that uh, I made a mistake in a pronunciation, and I, it's always, I'm always trying to be very careful about that, and that in referring to Rameyer Don Plutsky, the great, we call him in yeshiva circles, you just call him Rameyer Don. He actually came to America. He spoke at the Yeshiva Servitz uh, al in the 20s. Um, he, uh, so I said, he, I mentioned his sefer, uh, Klei Chemda. So he pointed out that it's actually Klei Chemda. Well, um, I actually looked online and lots of people say Klei Chemda, including Rabbi Bleich, but uh, that, that's irrelevant because lots of people can make a mistake, but I looked in the concordance. Two times the word is Klei Chemda, and one time it's Klei Chemda. Actually, this is interesting for another reason, I think, because um, in uh, Divrei Hayamim, uh, chapter 2, um, Lamed Beis, uh, Perak Lamed Beis, if you look at Chav Zayin, there we see it says, which means all manners of goodly vessels. But if you look in Nachal, uh, chapter 2, verse 10, it also says Mikol, it says Mikol Klichemda. And the translation is the same, all precious vettel, vessels. And that's what it means. Uh, we have and, and the same thing in Hosea. So here we have an example where the word Kli, although really Kli is one vessel and Kli is more than one, um, it really means the same thing. Uh, and therefore, if this was in the Torah, I think that if you uh, read Kli instead of clay, you would not have to repeat. Um, when I say not have to repeat, I mean, we assume you repeat if you make a mistake. Toso says you don't uh, make people repeat. Uh, and there's concerns people, I think even Toso might, the concern might be because of embarrassing people. Or Nachum Rabinovich held halacha maisa that a uh, bar mitzvah boy, you don't correct him because uh, there's these views that we don't need to correct. But um, the way we hold is that we do correct, but if it doesn't change the meaning of the word, believe it or not, even the word Aaron, if you say, hey, Reish Nun, Aaron, without the Aleph, they say that's that's good enough. So I think it's, it should be clear, I think, that if you would have said Kli instead of clay, since it really, Kli Chemda, it means the same thing. I don't think you would uh, repeat. But you can ask, it's irrelevant because it doesn't, uh, the word doesn't appear uh, uh, in, the, in the Torah. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. Next thing I wanted to point out to you, I, I listened to the tape and I saw I wasn't very clear in this business about uh, washing. If you have wet food, I said you have wet food, you eat it. The halacha is if you have food, take an apple and you uh, wash it and it's wet, you have to wash. That's what we ignore. And all the post game for hundreds of years want to know why, other than Pesach, where we do wash, we all know we get up early on the carpets. We get up and we uh, uh, we wash. Why we don't wash for um, for other foods? Um, okay, uh, Nachum uh, sends me uh, Nachum Shmaryahu. He says I'm incorrect. I said last class that uh, Chabad um, 
does one yom, one it doesn't do yom tov sheni if you go there. And he points out it's actually a machokas in Chabad. So I thank you, Nachum Shmariyal. In fact, I looked online. If you go to Chabadipedia, there's Wikipedia and there's Chabadipedia. They have an article on Yom Tov Sheni Shagalios, and they say that the problem is that uh, there's a, a stira, the Rebbe. The Rebbe in one place writes that uh, when you go to Israel, you do like they in Israel. And another place he says that, no, you should do a chutzarit. So while uh, there's all different ways to understand this, some say it means they distinguish me if you go with your wife or if you go by yourself. But Lamaisa, there's uh, different opinions and there's no one contrary to what I heard this from a Chabad guy. So he was only giving me one Chabad approach. But uh, Chabad does not have one, um, one uh, only one way of doing things. Okay, we have a few more minutes. I mentioned last class uh, this book, Jacob Katz's autobiography. And uh, I, I was... Basically, my memory was correct. If you look on page 82, and he, but he's a Musmach uh, in Frankfurt uh, from Jew, no question about it. But he writes about, uh, I was a little wrong. I mean, I didn't remember exactly the, the, the story. The story is as follows. In Frankfurt, he said that uh, the question was raised among us, namely among the Orthodox um, young academic types, why a Jewish historiography in the spirit of Orthodox Judaism has never been written. And he says that he replied as follows, quote, there is no Orthodox historiography because there is no Orthodox history. That is that the way the Orthodox tell you things happened really isn't how it happened. And then he says the very next page that the, he says the trend of my thinking matched well the school of historiography of Frankel. And he also mentions the Salma Schechter as well. But uh, so he says that although in religiosity, he you'd have to regard him as uh, orthodox. Um, and, but when it comes to the way his, his historical thinking, as I mentioned, we, we spoke about how uh, to understand halachic history, he views himself as part of, uh, uh, in the Franco school. Okay, got a couple of minutes. We have a uh, listener from Israel. I only know this because uh, his comments are in Hebrew. He left it on, uh, the, the, I think, two times ago or maybe three, the, the class on YouTube. I don't look. For the listeners, I don't look back at the classes and responds to comments on YouTube. But for the first couple of classes, I look just to see if anyone comments. And um, I say to you that, that you you cited very something very interesting, but you didn't give the source. So I'll give the source. What he cites is that Lieberman, Shaul Lieberman and Joseph Kivshuta also mentions a couple other people who refer positively to uh, Zachariah Frankel. And one of them uh, he mentions is the, uh, one of them that uh, Lieberman mentions is uh, uh, the Athenian the Island. If you look in uh, the back of the, um, the Bavli, you have a, I guess you call it a commentary, which uh, contrasts the Yerushalmi to the Bavli. And if you look in Bava Basra, well, first of all, it's in Joseph to give shoot to Bava Basra, page 335, he calls attention to the fact that the Yifei and I am cites um, Rav Zahir Frankel. And then he mentions, this is Lieberman, mentions this book. It's, uh, it's a, by Rav Gershon Mayer by Ruski, and it's called... Uh, uh, it's your, 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 your Shami, uh, one, let's see, uh, I'll show you, uh, hold on, let's see, here's the title page, you can see it on HebrewBooks.org, Bavakama of the Yerushalmi, with the commentary Yerushalmi Atzrufa. Now, this is an interesting volume, because it has a haskama from Reb Chaim Brisker, Reb Chaim Salvechen, and he, he, who's very uh, positive about this rabbi. There aren't many sfarim that have haskamas from Reb Chaim Salvechik. And if you look on the very first page of this uh, volume, in the second column, right where my cursor is, what does this Rav cite? Ayin Mavoha Yerushalmi, or of Zechariah Frankel. So you see this uh, big Talmud Chacham who wrote a Sefer in Yerushalmi also cites uh, Frankel. Maybe he didn't know everything we're going to talk about today uh, because uh, there are some issues. Uh, okay, so two more things I want to share with you. Um, and then we, in the very first class, I mentioned about the Frumkite of Frankel. And I told this story about the Erev, Frankel being more mocked than the other rabbis. And I said, I thought I saw it in Schwab. And I didn't find it there. Lo and behold, I found it. 
And uh, the story is almost how I remembered it. If you look in the, the periodical Hamayan, and if you look in my Sorenbach post, I discuss this word Mayan. The, 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 the biblical way of saying it is Mayan, Shiva under the eye, not Mayan. And I point out, as I pointed out in my classes, that uh, the popular girls' school in Teaneck, which calls itself a Ma'ayanot, gets it wrong. That's the, the proper word is Mayanot, not Ma'ayanot. But uh, on the bright side, pretty much everyone, I live in that area, we know people go there, everyone pronounces it correctly. When they write it, it's incorrect. But when they're speaking, everyone says Mayanot. I've never in my life heard anyone say, my kid goes to Ma'ayanot. It's all Mayanot. So that's correct. But so in the Torah journal, Hamayan, Volume 26, uh, Issue 4, an article by Abraham Shisha, he reports the following, which I think is really interesting, that um, he says, first of all, Frankel was completely observant, but he says, I heard this from Rabbi Shaya first. He was the rabbi of the Shif Shul. In Vienna, you had a shul, a separatist Orthodox shul, called the Shif Shul. It was founded by the Chassam and the Chassam Sofer's uh, sons-in-law. It existed until uh, World War II. And he told the following story, that, uh, and he heard this from Rabbi Yeshaya I in Lechworth, that's uh, during the war. Rabbi Yeshaya I uh, was able to escape from Vienna and make his way to England. That uh, Frankel once came uh, for holiday to uh, the city to uh, Baden next to Wien, or whatever, uh, uh, I guess that's a city there. It doesn't just mean the baths, uh, or maybe, because he calls it Baden by Wien. And uh, he, this is where a lot of the rabbis from Hungary and Galicia would go and take take the cure, as they used to go. Take in the, like the people who go to Syri Syracuse, so it knows, what do they call it? Not Syracuse, Saratoga Springs. So the, 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 um, the Skvera Rebbe, every year before COVID, would go back to um, Hungary to take the springs, uh, take the cure at the springs. And when the Torah Motion trip was there once, uh, he was there in uh, Bratislava. So it says that, uh, here's the story. Frankel uh, had a room in the hotel, the Jewish hotel, where many other Godolim were there. And he says that all the other Godolim would take their 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 talis bag, their items on Shabbos. They bring it to the the the, the chader ochel and bring it to where they daven. Frankel, alone among them, was medaktek shalom hotzi kum. He held, I guess, he held that uh, you know there was no um, they didn't make uh, an air of chatzeros. I think we assume that you don't need to, but uh, he he held that you needed an air of chatzeros, and therefore he didn't take anything out of his room. Now. First writes or first said, the rabbis of Galicia were very impressed by this uh, Rav Moderni, this modern rabbi who was so mocked. Loken Rabbanei Hagar, not so the Hungarian rabbis who knew about uh, Lieberman's ideas. So, uh, and we will see some of his ideas now. For next class, I will uh, I'll share with you a couple other things about Franco and also from. Uh, about the rabbinical seminary in Breslau from uh, Bernard Drachman's memoir. But I see it's already time, so let me put this down. In, uh, one more thing I have to tell you, though, although he was very, very from, uh, if you look in uh, Hamayan uh, volume uh, 26, issue 2, page, well, I don't know what page, the article by uh, Dr. David Hausdorff, where he met, he's dealing with Rabbi Ritter, the the Agudist rabbi of Rotterdam, who was very, um, he was very much an admirer of uh, Zachary Frankel. In this article, you see that Frankel used to carry an umbrella on Shabbos. So he's not so maybe machmir on that, but the Chassam Sofer held you can carry an umbrella on Shabbos. So that, that was the practice in a number of places. Even in Eretz Yisrael, I, in the past, I brought a, a tshuva safer that says you can. So I'm not going to, today, if you do that, you'd be in trouble. But I don't know, uh, I don't know that, you know, I'm going to go to Florida, God willing, in a couple of days. And in Florida, I mentioned this, I'll mention it again, because we have new people. You see something you don't see up here. Scooters. Not the electric scooters, those scooters, the, just the regular scooters kids drive. People are using them to come to show every Shabbos uh, in the hot weather. You could live, let's see, 15, 20 minutes away, use a scooter. Everyone does it. Now, I heard from my friend that in one of the big modern Orthodox shuls, the rabbi wanted to stop it because he didn't think it's in Shabbos spirit. But the problem is all the Haredi, they're all, and, and I, at the show I go to in Florida is full of Haredi 
quasi Haredi. The point is everyone's using it, and uh, I have yet to see anyone in my neck of the woods use it. And I think if you did, they'd look at you strange, but in Florida, everyone's doing it. So as goes Florida, so goes the nation. I assume we're going to start seeing, if not this coming summer, next summer, you'll start seeing people uh, with the scooters. There really isn't no different than a, uh, a tricycle. No one said a tricycle is a problem. Uh, the, the bicycle is an issue because of the gears or maybe the wheels, uh, you know, the 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 um, the chain. But uh, the, the scooter, it's just uh, there's nothing to break, really. So uh, I can see why it, it would become popular. And if the Haredi rabbis are saying it's no problem down in Florida, it's a little bit strange for the modern Orthodox rabbis to be saying it's a problem. Uh, Modern Orthodox to be more machmir than the Haredi, but usually that's matters, monetary matters, you know, uh, Dina de Machusa Dina, that sort of thing. But when it comes to Shabbos, uh, you know, I think uh, we can assume that uh, that the modern Orthodox uh, are not going to be any more machmir, I think. Uh, anyone, well, Gershon, who says he sees people riding the bicycles to show, if the Syrians want to do it, they can. The Ben Ishlai said so. There's a practice in the Syrian community, but Ashkenazim have never accepted it. And unless you're riding one of these bikes without a chain or something, really, there's no permission, in my opinion, for an Ashkenazi to ride a bicycle on Shabbos, unless a big posek said you could. But uh, I can tell you that no big posek has said you could. And even among the Syrians, it's becoming less and less popular uh, to ride it. Uh, okay. Um, the last thing we said last last class is I gave many examples of like halachic. Um, where the people do something, and that sort of changes the halacha because the rabbis, we're talking about pious communities, Kiel Kadosha, the rabbis are forced to find some justification for it uh, uh, in many cases. And I describe that as sort of in line with how Frankel describes how Jewish law operates. I quoted Chaim Salvechik, I quoted, I quoted many, I, I quoted academic scholars, but also traditional Torah scholars. And I, I ended with quoting the Rashtam of Shmuel de Medina, one of the greatest poskim in the uh, the early Achronic period, that we have to, uh, if the entire world, in rabbinic literature, they call it the Olam, the Olam. If the Olam is, when it, and the Olam means the religious Jews, <laughs> it's not the non-religious. But if the Olam is doing something, if the Olam is riding bicycles, not, not bicycles, scooters on Shabbat, then uh, you have to assume that there's some justification or you should try to find one. That's what uh, the, the Rashdam says. You should uh, exert yourself to find some justification for it. And that's where we ended off. Uh, we also spoke about this notion that um, uh, the rabbi, if, if we had a Sanhedrin, that we could, um, if the people, according to the Rambam, we said the Kesset Mishnah reads it, if the people accepted a Gezeira, a decree, a rabbinic law, let's say, and then they stopped doing it, then the rabbis uh, could get rid of it. We'll, um, you know, we're not going to say that you need to be greater or a greater based in. The rabbis uh, can get rid of it, um, but you would need a Sanhedrin. Unlike the case where uh, the, the, the people never adopted the practice. I want to show you um, one thing which is related to this, which I, I think is interesting. Uh, show you this isn't just uh, theoretical. Um, where is it? Uh, Rav, the Rav Chaim Hershenson, who was, I found this years ago. Uh, it's from a periodical called HaMitzpah. It's a periodical that appeared in the early 20th century in America, a Torah periodical, um, one of the first ones. I found it, and I made a copy of it, and then I sent it to Otsar Chachma and to HebrewBooks.org. So when you look on those sources, that's the one I sent them. But in the very first issue, you have an anonymous letter which was later revealed to be by Rechaim Hershenson because it created a big controversy. Um, uh, and I will discuss this if I ever get to do my book on uh, Halachic History of America. But Rabbi Hershenson is uh, struggling with the fact that you have among the American Jewish community ostensibly religious Jews, but they violate various things. So he, he has a theory, Rechaim Hershenson, we did classes on him so you can listen, but he has a whole approach that we don't want the people to be seen or to see themselves as sinners, because if they see themselves as sinners, they're going to just uh, sin more. So we're going to. He wants to try to find heterim if you can, to try to uh, justify, uh, even if it means bending over backwards, so that the people do not see themselves as sinners. So he puts forth, I think it's twenty-four questions of the time, and he wants to know whether we rabbis can uh, find a solution. And the first one is, 
in Yecholim Anu Hayom, if we, the rabbis today, can so heter is iser If we can find a heter for an iser derabanan that the people are violating, al pia klal the gzera shon ispashta berov hatzibur yachol matira ayde based in katan. Based upon the principle we've seen that if um, the people don't are not following it, that even a, a lesser based in can get rid of it. Now, I, I, he must be referring to with the Sanhedrin. Because the Rambam is clear that you need a Sanhedrin. It doesn't have to be a, uh, a, a based on a Godel. It doesn't have to be as great as the earlier based did. But uh, you would need a Sanhedrin. But that would mean, for instance, that any rabbinic uh, prohibition, and in, uh, in the early 20th century in America, there's a lot of these rabbinic prohibitions that weren't being observed by the people that, in theory, you can get rid of. And he goes on, and uh, he raises uh, other issues, uh, which... Um, well, just to quickly show you some of them. Number two deals with heating food up on Shabbos. Uh, um, five, non coat gavina cheese made by non-Jews, but it's all vegetable. There's a the, the accepted view is that we don't uh, eat that, although there is a position in Tosso that it's permissible, and Rav Soloveitchik actually held it was. He asks about that. Number six is an interesting one. What about those people who are machal Shabbos before Hesia? How we still regard them? He divides it into, are they violating rabbinic prohibitions, Torah prohibitions? Are they violating it because they don't care or they don't know any better? Um, let's see, uh, number eight, what about milking cows? You have Jews on Shabbos and Yom Tov. There's no non-Jews. We have people who lived, uh, he had Jewish farmers. And number nine, um, selling chametz, even if, if they sell their chametz, but they're still in the store, still using the, that is, they sell their chametz, but they're still selling it to non-Jews. They don't even own it, uh, technically. What do we do about that? Then uh, 28, okay, uh, 28 different issues he wants to deal with. Um, now, as I said, both Hershenson and Frankel assume that you have to deal with Kila Kadosha. All these things we're speaking about. I think uh, one of the ones he mentions there is um, shaving with a razor. I believe he, uh, yeah, number four. He says, uh, what about um, shaving with a razor? He says that in America, everyone has to shave. And they're not going to use that powder stuff, which uh, no one liked. Can you find a heter for that? Um, he actually found a heter. He, he has a response in which he claims that... Um, the the only razor that's forbidden is like the the long razors that would you go like this the long ones but the big type ones that uh, we had the though that would not be forbidden um, and he describes it how to do it but okay that that's basically not accepted um, before we go on I want to uh, make, say one more thing. And that's, um, I've had some private uh, email and correspondence with people because I, last class I mentioned that the Hassam Sofer says that um, even a rabbinic prohibition for emergency measure, we if the rabbis want to, post-Talmudic rabbis, they could um, suspend it. So where do you draw the line? You know, how much can the rabbis do? Um, I used to think, by the way, that all a lot of the things that we talk about that would only that you, you suspend um, prohibitions temporarily, that this is only for the rabbis, the Sanhedrin, or suspend uh, obligatory things only for Sanhedrin, or at the very least, uh, members of Chazal. Now I'm not convinced of that. I think uh, recognize Gadol Yisrael, I have enough sources that show that recognize Gadol Yisrael could also uh, do this, but they have to be of the level, I guess, of the Chasm Sofer. So, um, but I, you know, this is a topic I don't want to really get into that much because um, it's really relevant to the reform. But uh, from both Frankel and um, the Orthodox, they're really not moving in that direction of changing halacha at all. But since I was asked, I just want to show one source, and uh, it really needs to be investigated. Uh, but I, uh, this is a source that's cited uh, by many people. Robert Gordis, I, I recall him citing it. Anyone who believes that Jewish law needs to move, uh, maybe Berkowitz cites it, they cite this source. And I, I, don't, I don't know, 
how far you could take it, like I said, I think that the contemporary rabbis, if they're of a certain stature, do have this authority. I used to think not. I used to think it was only uh, rabbinic from the rabbinic period, uh, Amorayim or Tanayim. But let me show you what I'm talking about. And it raises the question, what's the definition then of, uh, of a reform? What can a rabbi do? In Masachet uh, Krito, Chris, in Yeshiva called Chrysos, Chris, Chrysos, um, there's a, it discusses the following issue, that a woman who gives birth uh, has to bring uh, a carbon, even if uh, she has a discharge of a zava, um, and before she can... Uh, before she can eat the food, she brings, let's say she has to bring five carbonos. Well, she brings one and she can eat from it. And then uh, she still has to bring the remaining uh, four. Um, and, but she can still eat, but she's still obligated to bring the remaining four sacrifices. The problem was that um, the price of uh, birds went up very much in Jerusalem. Um, and uh, people couldn't afford that. So uh, Rabbi Shema Gamaliel says, this is Mishnah 7, chapter 1, Chrysos. Rishon said, I swear by this abode of the divine presence, that's the word is ma'on, ha'mon azel lo alin halayla ad shihu binidarin. He said that, uh, I swear by the abode of the presence, I will not lie down tonight until the price of nests will be in silver dinars, not in gold dinars. Ultimately, he entered the court and he taught a woman who has in her case five definite discharges of a zava or five definite births brings one offering, and she may then partake of the meat offerings. And the remaining offerings, that is the other four, that are not even an obligation. So he's uh, he's getting rid of a Torah obligation here. And uh, her uh, here, and this was a temporary emergency measure, and the, the price of the, the birds dropped a great deal. Now, how could he do this? The Bartanura says as follows. This is Bartanura on the Mishnah. He says as follows. Even though he's being lenient in a Torah matter, the Torah says she has to bring the offerings. Rabbi Shimon Gamaliel says something that's not in accord with Halacha. He could do it um, because if not, then uh, they, the people were poor. They wouldn't have even uh, done, the women wouldn't have even been able to buy uh, one bird. And then they would have. Um, they violate the Yisr. The point is that here you see that Rabbi Shimon Gamaliel is able to uh, violate the halacha because of Eislasos, because it's an emergency. And uh, I, you, like I said, I used to think, we saw last class, the Chassam Sofer says when it comes to rabbinic prohibition, even contemporary rabbis can do that. Uh, Torah prohibition, he seems to imply not, but I have other sources that... Uh, at least I'm not convinced that contemporary rabbis would not, because of Eishasos, would not able to be do that as well. Okay. The last thing I want to do before we move into Franco and the dispute over Darchei Mishnah, I want to show you one final passage, and this from none other than Rav Kook, uh, the great Rav Kook. And um, I want you to look at this and see if you agree with me that... Uh, this is very, it sounds very much like Frankel, um, which, as I said last class, I think the general approach of Frankel, not what we're going to see today, which is more controversial, but the general approach of Frankel, how Jewish law operates, uh, that is, the people, if the religious people do something, that leads to a change uh, in many cases. Ruf Cook says the same thing, and I think that this can be justified by plenty of sources. I showed you a few. I want to show you a source now, another source. Uh, where Rav Cook is simply, uh, hold on a second, where is it? Rav Cook is simply saying something that uh, the historians, Yaakov Katz and the others, describe historically. He's providing a theological basis. It's in the Shmona Kvatsim. It's in Book 2, Kovetz 2, Number 30. And let me just read to you what Cook says, and uh, I have my own translation, I'll read it, but there's also a translation on Safaria. Someone is translating the Shulman, uh, well, you see, selected paragraphs uh, from Yaakov David Shulman, uh, but um, not all of it's translated. So here's what Cook says. There are times when there is a need to transgress the Torah. Now, what does that mean, transgress the Torah? Uh, how could there ever be a time? Okay, that's, that's what Cook says. 
Ve'en bedor misha yuchal harosas aderach. There is no one in the generation that can show the way. Because now look, there's a need to transgress the Torah. We'll see what this means. Well, like, like, look, let's say um, the pro providence wants us to be wearing regular clothes. Doesn't want us to dress anymore uh, old fashioned. But of course, that you, you can't change your clothes. That would, uh, you have to, you can't just dress like the Goyim. So there's a, there, there's a necessity for whatever. God has his reasons. But we don't have a mechanism. So how did you do this? Baha inyan al yadehis partsut. The matter comes through breaching. That is the irreligious. You have, um, and maybe this is going further than. Um, uh, Frankel, because well, I shouldn't say they're religious. No, he parts of people start. Uh, this is the religious people. They start breaking with uh, the uh, the practice. They start violating it. Umikomakom yoser tov hu olam sheavo inyan keza aideshkaga. Rav Cook says it's better that this uh, break with the practice, that is, the people stop observing comes through a shkaga, that is, uh, by um, not knowing any better, unintentionally. And this, he says, was Munach this is what we know, this principle of mutav shi value mazidim, that the better they be unwitting than Dilbert Sinayers. Then Rav Kook says, raksha nevua shruya b'Israel, only when you had nevua in Israel, Efshar was, uh, was it possible to make a takana inyan kaze ayide harasha? Could you um, institute, um, we're not talking um, in opposition to halacha through emergency measure. Now, um, I don't know, because we just saw that um, Rabbi Shimon Gamaliel didn't have Navu and he did it. But that's what Rav Cook says. I mean, when it's, um, there could be distinctions here between. Um, uh, positive commandments that you don't do versus negative commandments you violate. The whole the story of Eliyahu at uh, Hara Carmel. Uh, uh, that's what I think he's referring to, actually violating negative commandments as opposed to lack of doing a positive one, um, perhaps. Okay, so when you have Navua, then you can make these decrees. Harasha, emergency measures. Vaaz nasa b'derech heter mitzvah v'loi. Then you can do it uh, uh, in a permitted way. However, now that we don't have nevuah, we don't have any nevuah, how, how, how can Jewish law be updated? That is the correction, the adjustment to the law happens through um, a break. It causes the, um, the heart to... Um, it saddens the heart, I guess you would say. Actually, this is incorrect. This is from Arpei Torah. It doesn't, the actual text is more striking. It says that it saddens the heart with the externals and it uh, gladdens it with its inner content. Uh, what they did when they published Arpei Torah, they they uh, censored it a little. So um, this is not the actual, uh, this is a little bit of a, um, this is from the, the version that appears in our Pile Tohar, I believe. Um, hold on a second. I'll uh, hold on. I'll tell you right now. I got my uh, my volume here. I'm very surprised. I have to tell Safaria if they um, if this is the case because. Um, Yes, the, what we're looking at is the translation, the version that appears in our Pile Torah. In the uh, in the Shemona Kfatzim, it says, mitzad yusa. That is, when you uh, look on the outside, you see that people are violating halacha, that causes sadness. Mitzad yusa. But it uh, gladdens those who see the inner content, namely people who can see clearly. What this is, in other words, when continued adherence to a certain halacha will have negative consequences, we we don't have a mechanism to abolish halacha. We don't have a mechanism to update halacha. We don't have a Sanhedrin. Providence ensures that people begin to violate the halacha, religious people. And in time, this is then what used to be regarded as a violation. The post scheme begin to accept it, and they begin to be Muhammad's list, because if everyone's doing it, then you try to find some justification. Um, this is exactly how Frankel describes Jewish law, how uh, Yaakov Katz, that uh, 
but and Rav Kook is adding here the uh, the theological element that sometimes the hashkacha God wants us to move in a different direction. He wants us to not to be observing, let's say, this law. How else to explain the fact that a black letter law is is uh, completely ignored? It's because the Kodesh Baruch Hu wants us, for reasons we can't understand perhaps, no longer to do it. Uh, why is it that we don't wash anymore when we eat, eat wet food? For whatever reason, there was a, a, a reason to go beyond this. And the, this happened because people started breaking the law. At least it was thought to be the law. And then it becomes accepted. Uh, later generations can find justifications for it. Uh, so it's it's a really, it's a striking passage in Rav Kook. It was never published by Ritzvi Yehuda. And then when it was first published, it was censored a bit. But now we have the actual text. And Rav Kook is really is describing exactly the historical reality that all the historians have discussed. And he's giving a theological reason, though. Why does Jewish law work this way? Uh, why do we see over and over again, halacha, People violate it. Religious people, otherwise religious people. The rabbis protest. The protests are of no use. And in later generations then say, well, there must be some justification because mina yisraelu, and they they then justify it. So Rav Cook sees this as hashkacha protest working to move us away from the halacha for whatever reason, because today we don't have a Sanhedrin, so we don't have a mechanism to um, update halacha, as it were. Um, so it's striking from Rav Kook, but that's uh, that's uh, that's a famous passage in, in in Israel. They call Rav Kook the Rav. Okay, now let's continue what, where we were. What makes Frankel so controversial, though? What we've seen so far is maybe a little edgy, a little provocative, but nothing. At least I would argue nothing uh, out of the out of the fold. Uh, you'd think that uh, he would be a good. Uh, a good ally in the battle against the reformers. Uh, why was he not regarded as an ally against the reformers by most? And it's because he sets forth a view of halacha, not only in the post talmudic period, that's what I've discussed so far, but also even in the ancient rabbinic period, that is in the days of Chazal, the way he describes it, he sees it as a developing system such that it calls into question, or at least calls into question for most people, what is traditionally understood as Torah Shaval, the oral law. And uh, let us now turn to his book, Darche HaMishnah, because that's where matters come to a head, and this is going to be the great controversy. Um, and I'll present the facts to you, and you can decide uh, where you stand. And... Uh, uh, I, I think after this controversy, it's really hard to put Franco in the orthodox camp, uh, but uh, let's look at it. Uh, he had dealt with Jewish law before. Um, he has a, a book on the on the Jews of Alexandria and their exegesis and on the Septuagint. He was actually the first modern Jewish scholar to deal with the Septuagint, the Greek translation. But in 1859, his work, Darche HaMishnah, appears. I have to say that um, it's all sometimes transliterated Darke HaMishna with a K-E-I, just like Darke Shalom. And I said it once, I say it again, the word is Darche. There's no Dagesh in the Chaf. So it's it's Darche HaMishna. Um, it has a lot to say about Darche HaMishna. It's, uh, it's a very important work. It really, um, in the history of Mish Mishna interpretation, I shouldn't say not interpretation of Mishnah like the Bartanura, but interpretation of what, what Mishnayas are, where the whole idea of the Mishnaic system. It's very important. And leaving aside the dogmatic issues we're going to get to today, the book is uh, designed to discuss the Mishnah, how it was compiled, uh, what principles uh, went into it um, uh, in the compilation. When was it written down? That's a huge controversy. When when was it written down? I'll get to that in a second. Uh, what principles were used to determine what goes in and what goes out? After all, you have to accept why what's in the Mishnah? Well, the order of it, he's interested in that also, something we've dealt with, what materials included, which people are involved in the Mishnah. How early do we have traditions included in the Mishnah? And included in the book is a section on Halacha Moshe Misina. And that's going to be the controversial section. Now, Frankel believes, just segueing for a second, 
that the Mishnah is already written down in the times of Rebbe, Rebbe Yudanasi. This is a very big controversy because you have two schools of thought. You have one school of thought saying it was already written down as sort of like a private uh, uh private documents that uh, not as an official, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I think some hold it was actually officially written down. Frankel, he sees it more as written down, but as like private documents uh, that people would have for themselves. And others don't see it written down until the end of the Talmudic period. This goes back to a, um, the Rishonim argue about, this goes back to a dispute between two versions of Rav Shari Ragon. The letter of Shari Ragon, which is sent uh, by Shari Ragon to uh, Karuan in um, Tunisia. Um, there, we have two versions of it. One version claims that Rebbe wrote the Mishnah, and the other version says, no, that was written down. He, you could say Rebbe organized it, but it wasn't actually written down to the end of the Talmudic uh, period. Um, for Lieberman... Um, he thought that was correct because he says nowhere in the Gemara do you have examples where they say, well, you know, bring me the Mishnah. You don't have, on the other hand, Frankel cites proofs where you have disagreements uh, regarding the Mishnah, but the disagreement could only have arisen if you're dealing with a written text. That is, they argue about a word, how it's spelled, let's say, uh, and uh, it can only be if there was a written text. On this matter, I just want to share something with you on my, my, my post which I just put on the starting blog, I have a, a link to a, a video of Professor, my teacher, Isdor Yitzhak Torsky. That's the second one I posted. I posted an earlier one, in the last my last post, which I found in the University of Scranton. I took a video of him when he came in um, 1993, I think it was. The problem is that you can hardly hear him speaking, but it's nice to put it there to see him. The new one, uh, which I knew nothing about. Thank uh, Dr. Mark Herman for calling my attention to it. For some reason, uh, it's not in the, Torsky's name is not mentioned in the description, but when Mark Herman um, watched the previous video on the side, it pulled this one up. So YouTube is so smart, it knows who's in the video, even though it's not in the description. But there you see Professor Torsky, it was a whole issue on great inflation, and you hear, you can hear his voice you, perfectly, you see him. And I, I was at Harvard at this period, and I don't even remember. I didn't know about this event. As far as I know, this is the only example, these two videos, which I posted, one of which you really can't hear, the only examples there are of videos of uh, the late Yitzhak Isidor Torsky available. Uh, there's a short one, which I also posted, where he introduces in Yiddish Chaim Grada. But no, other than that, nothing else is out there. So if anyone who went to Harvard or knew Professor Torsky, I encourage you to go look at the video that I uh, that I linked to, which was put up by Harvard uh, not long ago. But so why do I mention this? Because I just uh, Torsky um, in his book on the Riva Rabad, he uh, on page one thirty three, uh, he deals with this whole issue of. Uh, the, the authorship of the Mishnah, why it was written, and the same issue that Frankel deals with, and he points out that there's also another dispute among the Rishonim, uh, not uh, just when it was actually written, but why it was written. Frankel, of course, discusses this as well, but uh, he, he points out that the Rambam's approach is that the reason the Mishnah was written was because of difficult times. The circumstances are so difficult, um, the Rambam says in the introduction of the Mishnah Torah, Talmidim mismatin, the hochin, vatsaras mishad shosubaos, that times are so difficult that they had to publish it. They had to write, put it together. Um, on the other hand, there's another school of thought from Rashi, also based on one of the versions of Rashi Ragon, and uh, other sources that say, as, as reading Tversky, the Mishnah did not arise desperately from adversity, but emerged deliberately from transient good fortune. Rashi says, "V'nachu mitzara, v'shalach the kibetz kol tamid out to show." This is in Bava Bava Bavmatzia thirty three b. So Rashi and others say that no, it was dafka the good times that they rested from persecution, and that's what enabled them to put this together. So Frankel deals with all these uh, matters. Uh, he has other theories about the Mishnah. I don't want to deal with it. It's not really relevant. Uh, although he does, he does discuss the order of the Masachtas. Uh, this is before uh, Geiger's view is, is known. 
And he argues that you can explain the order logically. Uh, so for Zerayim, he thought it made sense that you brachos are matters commonly observed and you go work your way all the way to oral, let's say, they're not so commonly observed. I, I tried to look through. I, it doesn't really work. We have to say that Geiger, Geiger's explanation is the proper explanation. Um, okay, so what's the problem with Darche Mishnah? On the one hand, you could say it's a scholarly work, uh, important, talking about the Mishnah, but it's more than that. As I said, he historicizes the oral law, and the orthodox response is not long in coming. What do I mean by saying he historicizes the oral law? Well, obviously, everyone has to acknowledge, Frankel included, that there is an oral tradition. There's a, you can't get away from it. In fact, the uh, I just saw today in the Encyclopedia Judaica, if you look on the entry dealing with the oral law, and this is not an orthodox book, the Encyclopedia Judaica, it's a book of scholarship. Um, so um, it, it says as follows. Uh, he talks about there's a strong and close bond between the written and oral law, and you can't have one without the other. So, for example, they give examples. There's contradictions in the written law. There's not clarity. It says you'll be put to death. Well, what type of death? Uh, when it says that you should afflict your souls, uh, like Yom Kippur, what does that mean, you should afflict your souls? Uh, um, there's no, uh, no no quantities are given for leket, shech, There's lacuna. You have reference to the laws of marriage. And divorce, but you don't tell that we don't know how how you're supposed to be married and divorced. Uh, it says that there's um, that if you fog someone, you can't have more than the fixed number of lashes. It doesn't say though which transgressions get the punishment of lashes, and it goes on and on and on examples where you see that uh, it says if you work on the Sabbath, there's a punishment if you work. But what's the definition of work? <laughs> and you tell us someone who doesn't know that much about Torah, you say that. Um, you know, you could carry uh, big items, heavy items uh, around uh, your house or around the neighborhood and neighborhood. That's not working. But if you uh, go out to your garden and then plant a little flower there, that's working. Uh, people won't get it. And that's because the word work for Malacha is not really the best uh, translation. It's the best we have. But so everyone agrees there has to be some oral law. But uh, what do we mean by an oral law? How much of an oral law? And what does what does the oral law encompass? That is, it's one thing to say, well, there have to be traditions going back. So if you say that if you work on the Sabbath, you have to know what work is. But what about every page of the Gemara? What about drushas? What about halacha Moshe Misinai, as we'll see? And I think the best way to see this, to see the, the controversy and the problems that Franco's position uh, created, is to begin with the attack from the Orthodox on him, because the attack points out the very passages that we'll see, from these passages, we'll see what the problem is from the Orthodox perspective. And also, these are the passages that show us uh, Frankel's position. And fortunately, we can see this uh, very well in um, the collected writings of Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch, volume five, because this volume is devoted, it, it's called The Origin of the Oral Law, and it uh, has uh, many of uh, Hirsch's uh, articles dealing with it. And then in part two, for over 100 pages, it's devoted to uh, Frankel's Darche Mishnah. Here, too, they write Darche Mishnah. It's Darche Mishnah. And it begins, or Hirsch used to have a, a journal, and it begins with an article by a rabbi, uh, Gottlieb Fischer, a Hungarian rabbi. He was a Baal boss, but uh, he had smicha. He was a student of the Chosim Sofer. He was not, he didn't serve as a rabbi of community, but in those days, you had lots of people who were great time in the who didn't serve as rabbis of community. And he wrote an article uh, in uh, Hirsch's journal. And uh, let me see. Here they translate it as an epistle by Rav Gottlieb Fisher to all friends of truth and um, of our Jewish future. Um, now, um, I can't remember. Uh, it, yeah, this begins uh, what happened. He wrote it in Hebrew and Hirsch, I'm reading it here. Hirsch translated it into, um, into German. Okay, so what does, uh, what does he say? Well, I just want to begin on page 213. Right at the beginning, 
um, Fisher says that um, he says, I wouldn't go after Franco if Franco was a reformer. If uh, if Franco was like the people that we know from the rabbinic conferences of Brunswick, Frankfurt, and Breslau, if he was a reformer, I would have remained silent. However, he says that since the author, he says, delights in deceptive appearances, since he wraps himself in the cloak of a true believer in tradition, and we know that he's a completely observant, he says he speaks with great respect of the Sofri, the Anshe Knesset and the Tanaim, and yet his views are completely apart from them. So that's why Fisher has to expose Frankel. Because Frankel, on the outside, seems like he's a, not just an observant Jew, that there's no doubt, he seems like he's an Orthodox Jew. And many people have assumed that he's a, quote, Orthodox Jew. And therefore, what Fisher is going to show is that from his writings, he can't be placed in our camp. And um, he says that uh, Frankel is a star among our scholarly contemporaries, Therefore, and he's the principal of rabbinical seminary, and therefore we need to expose that what he says is full of fallacies that will lead the minds of our contemporaries astray from the Torah, that is away from the dogmas. Uh, and um, he says, quote, any honest critic will have to admit that no matter how hard Frankel, how, no matter how hard Frankel tries to exalt the sages who have handled down the oral law, his principles are in sharp contrast to their teachings. Though he voices disapproval and contempt when referring to the Sadducees who reject the oral tradition, he basically sides with them and, and subscribes completely to their principles. So Frankel is a Sadducee. Now, what do you mean Frankel is a Sadducee? Frankel is a Sadducee. How could Frankel be a Sadducee when uh, all he does is talk about how great the oral tradition is and is a complete observer of halakha? Because the Sadducees denied the, denied the oral law. They denied the mosaic origin of the oral law. So what Fisher is saying is that Frankel, despite the fact his practices, he denies the mosaic origin of the oral law. Frankel, so in that sense, he agrees with the Pharisees. Now, Frankel, as Fisher says, is going to attribute the oral law to the Anshe Knesset Agdola. So obviously the Sadducees didn't do that. They didn't accept the oral law at all. But um, the fundamental point is that Frankel does not uh, attribute it to a mosaic origin rather later. Well, is that true? Is that what Frankel says? That's what we're going to have to examine now. In fact, uh, after this uh, strong introduction, Fisher says, well, let's see what our author says about uh, the, 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 uh, the meaning of what the mitzvahs are, halacha moshemi sinai, and the 13 hermeneutical principles. So traditionally, we have this notion of halacha Moshe Sinai, that there are laws that uh, are not in the Torah, but are thought to come down from Sinai, and also the hermeneutical principles. So you have a Gezer uh, What is a Gezer Is a Gezer just something uh, that the rabbis uh, make up, or is that something that... Now, all these matters are going to be more complicated than Fisher, and uh, less complicated, I would think, than um, Franco. I think we'll be able to find even a middle ground. But uh, let's start with the, and we're going to have the maximalist position and a minimalist position. But let's start with the Fisher maximalist position, that um, the 13 Midos, that the Torah, that these come from Sinai, and Allah Moshe Sinai, I mean, we're going to see it's not so clear, even with Gezer Shava, because often what's a Gezer Shava is not really a Gezer Shava, but we'll get, I'll give you some examples of that. And uh, he says, he, he begins by quoting Frankel. In the introduction to the um, Darchea Mishnah, Frankel says that um, the interpretations of the Anshe Knesset Hagdoa, and uh, who are also the Sofrim, um, that uh, the, the, their works of interpretation are great and complex. It requires painstaking research. Um, et cetera, et cetera. He said, for, for by this work, the laws were interpreted for theory and practice and others. Frankel says that the Anshe Knesset Hagdoa were the first ones that they. Um, they started interpreting the law, and then, of course, the law continues to be interpreted. And he says, this is the oral tradition. This is the oral law. Vahu ikar Torah Shabalpeh. So what's the Torah Shabalpeh, he tells us? The, um, the interpretations of the halachot and the law by the men of the great assembly, Anche Sadola, who were also known as the Sofri, because these men interpreted the law and appended their interpretations to the scriptural text 
this is the oral Torah. Well, okay, if that's the oral Torah, then what's going on here, Frankel? Isn't the oral Torah supposed to go back to Sinai? And you're saying that the oral Torah is, um, is something we can identify with the interpretations of the sages. Well, and, and, I mean, uh, in one sense, we refer to the whole Gemara as the oral Torah, but that's not what Frankel's talking about. Frankel does not say in the introduction that uh, in describing the Mishnah, he doesn't say, for instance, that there are traditions that go back to Sinai and uh, they're recorded in the Mishnah and where there's disputes, the disputes are recorded and then the Talmud is... No, no. He begins, he, he mentions Torah, but then he moves on to uh, Anshe Knesset Sadoa. And now obviously that would continue with the into the Tanaitic era. And he says that this is the oral law. Well, Fisher says, this is in contradiction to the Rambam. The Rambam says in the introduction to the Mishnah Torah, quote, all the laws were given to Moshe and Har Sinai together with their explanations. It says, call mitzvah shanitnu all the Moshe and Sinai beferish. They were given with their explanations. And um, it's, it's, it's the Gemara, the Rambam, that I've given you the tablets, uh, the, the, the teaching and the commandment, um, a Torah of mitzvah. What is that? Torah. That's Torah shibachsav mitzvah zoperusha. Um, and then the Rambam says that uh, we're obligated v'tzivanu l'asos a Torah al pi a mitzvah u mitzvah zoi and he creates Torah shibalpeh. So we see that the Rambam holds, and it's explicit in the Rambam that Torah shibalpeh, that is the explanation of the commandments, goes back to Sinai. And yet Frankel in Darchei Mishnah he doesn't say that. He said he describes the explanations as originating with the uh, Anshe Knesset Sagdola, and uh, and that, that's what the Torah Shabbat is. He says that the interpretations of the Torah Shabbat were not the products of any individual man; rather, they uh, they were the product of all the sages coming together who uh, studied the Torah and came up with understandings of what the psuki means. So on the one hand, you could say, that's great. You're looking, you're, you're putting him on a pedestal. But on the other hand, Fisher says, what happened to the Torah Shabbat by going back to Moshe? Uh, I see it's already 928, so we're going to have to stop here. Next class, we're going to get into great detail. Fisher's criticism, Frankel's response what Hirsch has to say, what Shalmo Yehuda Rappaport has to say, and then something amazing from Frankel, where um, had he said it at the beginning, maybe there wouldn't have been need for all this controversy. Because wait till you hear what Frankel uh, says at the beginning, at, at the end of all this. But uh, And next class, we're going to get into this idea of Halacha Moshe Misenai and uh, Frankel's proof from the rush that his position is a traditional position. Um, Okay, let me take uh, the questions and uh, comments. We'll have uh, definitely have a few more classes dealing with Frankel. And then I'm thinking, uh, as a couple of you asked, I think before moving into the next thing, if Rabbi Kelman gives us things, thinks it's a good idea, I think he does, uh, maybe a class or two on the letters of the Rav I published. I've received letters from an, emails from a number of you about these letters in Hakira, so I can explain about these letters of Soloveitchik. Uh, and then I want to do Mordechai Kaplan. <laughs> but maybe we'll do first the Musser, I mean, do the, the Hirsch-Bamberger dispute, and then we'll do Kaplan. Because uh, um, uh, we should cover everything. Um, someone privately asked, did I see a review of uh, the book on of uh, the Golem of Montreal on Udo Rosenberg? Yes, uh, I, I saw that. I have the book by Ira Robinson. Um, Thomas said, on bicycles, the really rickshaws, there's a permissive response by the Ben Ishchai. Um, yes, the Ben Ishchai uh, permitted it. I don't know why you say rickshaw. He mentions uh, he mentions bicycles. He, uh, I believe, doesn't he? Um, he does, it's to Bombay. And um, I thought he says it's in the, it's in the Rav Paolin. Um I, I forget now. Um, I, I think he mentions explicitly bicycles um, in the tshuva. And that was the tradition. That was the Iraqi uh, tradition as well. I'll, I'll check uh, later. Um, he, he mentions he mentions bicycles. He's referring to bicycles uh, in the Rav Pahalim. Uh, 
A rickshaw is when someone pulls you. That was also an issue. They also did that uh, in India. Uh, that was based upon Hetarian, but I don't remember if that's based on the Beni Shai. If you can check it, let me know. Uh, yes, so someone privately points out that when you have a Sanhedrin, any of the, any drushas, we can change. I mentioned that already. You can change. Uh, I gave you the example of women as witnesses, so you can change it. You can find another drusha. In my fourth kind book on Rav Kook, Rav Kook deals with this at great length. Uh, he says that you can use drusha. So yes, you can have 22 malachot. You can do a, a you, you can do everything. Uh, what is the, Eric says, what's the dominant modern academic viewpoint about when the Mishnah was actually written down? I don't know, actually. I don't know if there's, we have some people listening to the classes who know more about this than I do. I don't know if there's a dominant uh, a viewpoint that uh, is the standard approach right now. Marty uh, says, how do you determine how great a Sanhedrin is or a posseg? Isn't there an idea in the, what's the greatness of the rabbis declined in every generation? No, when it says, well, when we, when it says, um, uh, uh, well, um, we saw the Rambam that it has to do with students. B'chachma, it's a good question. Um, it's, it has to be great. I, I think generally we assume that it has to be a general assumption that they're greater. Um, if the rabbis decline in each generation, that's uh, that's an, that's a way to ensure that uh, you can never over overrule them because the generations decline. But in the matter we're speaking about now, about drashot, uh, or a gazera, which wasn't accepted, you don't need uh, to be greater. Uh, I'll see if I have other interpretations of that for next class, though. Um, okay, when Eric says, when were the men of the great assembly supposed to have lived and done their interpretations? That's the great mystery, uh, the, 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 the men of the great assembly, which we don't know... Uh, we don't know much about. Uh, I mean, so Rambam, uh, Rambam includes Ezra, right, among the Anshak and Um it, It's hard to know, and it's it's so it's really hard to know. Is it 300 BCE? Is it earlier? Uh, it, it, it's very mysterious. Uh, I mean, is Ezra really part of the Anshak and Sometimes uh, he's described as sort of uh, being the, the the beginning of it. Uh, Ah, so now someone privately says sends me a link to chainless bicycles from the 19th century. So I'll have to take a look at that later. Uh, but um, you know, it raises the question about the, the Beni Shchai, what type of bicycle the Beni Shchai in the 20th century was dealing with. Uh, it could be that the Beni Shchai, uh, it's completely separate. Uh, um, you know, the issue of the Beni Shchai is um, you're making a gazera. Uh, the Ben Ishai held that uh, it's permissible, and the opponents said, said well, we can't. They extend the Gezeira. Just like you can't ride a, a horse, let's say, on Shabbos, because he might pull a branch, therefore you can't ride a bicycle, because what it might lead to. So people challenge that. Defenders of the Ben Ishai's position, well, how can you make a new Gezeira? And the answer is that it's not, this is what Frank said, it's not a new Gezeira. What we're doing is simply extending. A horse is a means of travel, a uh, bicycle is a means of travel, so it's all in the same uh, genre. So we're just we're not making a new gazera; we're just extending uh, the original gazera. Others said uh, gave other reasons not to ride a bicycle. Shabbos spirit, but um, again, Shabbos spirit. It's hard to know uh, what the, the the Shabbos spirit is. So we uh, it, it could change in different uh, eras, but. Um, it's hard to imagine that bicycles, could, when we haven't ridden bicycles for 100 years, and it's the unanimous Ashkenazic Mindog, not to, and it's even falling by the wayside among the Sephardim, the people you see riding bicycles, are, are they the ones Franco would say are the, 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 the religious Jews? Are, we, are these the kids with the black hats that I see riding the uh, scooters? When you see guys who look very firm riding bicycles, then we can have the conversation again. Maybe then the practice will change, but um, uh, I don't see it happening. Okay, Rabbi Kelman. Okay, thank you. So I, I think it's it's generally assumed Ezra is the founder of Anshik Nesed Agdol. I think that's the way it's generally assumed. Um, but anyways, and uh, and probably Bechachma, so I'm holding here, you know, 
Kellner's book, Menachem Kellner on Maimonides in the Quantum Generation, where he claims uh, the Rambam doesn't accept the idea that the generations are becoming less. We know in knowledge we're becoming more. I mean, obviously we advance, science advances, knowledge advances, but everybody agrees with halakha kibatrai. Everybody agrees to halakha is like the later sage because, you know, the midget on the shoulders of the giant. So even if even if we want to say we're lesser, I assume the chokma would we have more knowledge, not necessarily that we're greater, but we've accumulated more knowledge. So that's why you could say, because otherwise the whole thing makes no sense, because then you'd never have a bait team that could overturn the ruling of a bait team. Oh, okay. I'm going to look into this. It's really interesting. Um, it's an interesting question. Now, you mentioned Ezra, but they also say that Zachariah was, a, you know, you have passages talking about the, early, the later Navim, Zachariah. Right. Zachariah, Zachariah, Malachi, think, Malachi, right. Malachi. Yeah, we're also in the Ajax uh, Nes Sagdola. So um, it, it's really hard to know. And I have to tell you that um, there are those who, uh, I mean, some cynical, critical academic scholars who don't believe in the whole thing about Jake Zadola. They think that this is just a later creation. Uh, uh, and Franco doesn't say this, but they think that uh, at best you had earlier sages, but the idea that you had an organized court, an organized thing, they, they see that as a fiction. That's what uh, some skeptical academic scholars uh, would say. You know, Okay, I don't know. Listen, and the, finally, uh, <laughs> Jacob says the people I see riding bicycles and Shabbos are the ones watching our classes. Only the ones I think from the Syrian community. I hope at least. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay, thank you. Halacha is very broad. What can we say? Yeah. Very uh, different approaches within the halachic uh, you know, system. Yeah. I mean, it is hard to really know why bicycles should be us, or but that's for and you know another time. But anyways. Okay, thank you. Please, God, we'll see you next week. Uh, happy Thanksgiving for American Thanksgiving for all the Americans here. And enjoy your time in Florida. Please, God, we'll see you next Monday. And uh, tomorrow, continue our regular schedule. Yeah, um, you want to say something? No. Oh, yeah. Let's say we built a bicycle that uh, that's like a tricycle. I mean, technically, it would be permissible. So with the rabbis permitted, but, it's but like I don't that know umbrella. What the the Shabbos, David Eisen sent me the Shabbos umbrella. We have this umbrella that doesn't close all the way. So it's always a little bit open. And a lot of big rabbinim in Israel, including Rav Nevinsal, as I recall, gave permission for it on Shabbos. Uh, uh, so, I mean, you I can haven't imagine. Heard that it should, uh, I'll tell I... you next class, the Shabbos umbrella. But uh, you can imagine we could create, if a scooter is okay on Shabbos, why can't you make a bike like a scooter? Like where there's no chains, right. there's no nothing. Yeah, but it, it, this idea that because it may break, that's an invented reason. There, there's no reason in halacha to... Well, you might fix it. That. You know, mataki, shama mataki. Yeah, but that's true about anything. There was, why make that zero on, on a bicycle? We don't make new zero. I mean, it might... How often does a bicycle break? You know, okay. I, I, I understand that's what people say, but I don't know that one has to say that. There's no halachic necessity to say because a bike has a chain, you can't ride it. That's like an well, you could say a, a, a baby carriage could also break. So they just they, that's why they say there's a chain. But you're right; they're making this up as you know they're trying to find reasons to. Right, I understand they don't want to allow bicycles. Fine, whatever. But it it, it could have easily gone the other way. That bike, in other words, uh, well, there's no. So what are you saying? Shabbos spirit is the real reason why. Uh... Yeah, I would assume so. I would assume mm-hmm. new with transportation. Yeah, I, I don't. Move to I mean, the, yes. the home. Ufta de Chol, right? Uh, whatever it is. But a scooter's of the Chol. That's the problem. That's the rabbi. Right. The you know, it's like Shabbos everything. Said. And is, is yeah. playing basketball, Ufta de Chol. I mean, you know, that's all these. Yeah. It's a, it's a little bit subjective. I think in South mm-hmm. Africa, people would play sports. The firm community play, play sports on Shabbos. I think that was just accepted. It's part of the Minucha. You know, I yeah. believe in what the early Adad Journal, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, article, Berman, Saul Berman. There, there's a whole article on playing sports on Shabbat. Yeah. Uh, whatever, yeah. you know, different societies define what is keeping with the Shabbat spirit differently, and they can change over time. Yeah. But, uh, anyways, no, it'd be interesting if bikes were, listen, I we had, I remember when I was around, there was someone in shul, he stopped driving his car and he rode his bicycle. I thought, great, I, I, that's, that's a, you know, if, uh, the, the choice was his car or his bike. So obviously, there's no question what you tell the person to do. But anyways, yeah. okay, we'll see you next week. Thank Continue you. Everybody. next week. Blah, 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 okay, blah. tomorrow, Nava Finkelman at 11, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Shulman at 1, and everybody have a wonderful day, wonderful week. And I uh, hope to see you soon. And please invite a friend. Thank you very much. Lila Thom.
Oh, Chag Hoda, yeah, you have the Hoda on Hoda, yeah, yeah, Turkey Hoda, you know, and uh, Chag Hoda. Okay. Uh, so the regular day here, regular work day in Canada, Thursday, Friday, but okay. Okay. <laughs> Anyways.